Good evening and welcome to the NOVA Gubernatorial Candidate Forum. This is the third and final NOVA Candidate Forum for the 2021 election cycle. My name is Melissa Bodwin, Chair of the 11th Congressional District Republican Committee, and I will be serving this evening as your MC. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this evening's event. The forum this evening is hosted by the 8th, 10th, and 11th Congressional Districts and Fairfax County GOP. On behalf of each of your NOVA Republican committees, I'd like to welcome you all and thank you for joining us this evening. Like you, we're looking forward to hearing from the vision and the plans of our candidates and what they are thinking they need to do to restore the Commonwealth to sane, sound governments. We would like to thank at this point the sponsors of this evening's forum, Ivan Reitman and Melissa Bodwin. Before we begin the program this evening, we have some heroes that have helped us make these forums a success. And we just can't let the curtains fall on these forums and let our heroes go unsung. While the 8th, 10th, and 11th congressional districts have been the feature of the forum, it has been Fairfax County GOP, and more specifically, Sean Rastatter, that has been facilitating the technology side of these events. Their dedication has resulted in hours of kindness, collaboration, and hard work. So Steve, Sean, and the entire Fairfax GOP team, thank you. Thank you for facilitating the technology portion of these events. But more importantly, thank you for all of your excellent hard work and all that you do to fight for our conservative values. To begin the program this evening, it's my pleasure to introduce to you John Rostadder. He's our Fairfax County GOP Vice Chair. He's going to lead us in the prayer this evening. Sean? Thank you, Melissa. Thank you all for joining, uh, joining us this evening. If we could bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us this evening, and albeit it might not be in person, you know, it's it's just really great to be here with fellow Republicans, fellow God-fearing people, you know, united in one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to do your will, Lord God. How awesome is it that we have a God who cares about us individually, each and every one of us, loves each and every one of us, all of our flaws, and we have a direct line to the creator of the universe, the king of all kings, that we can speak to that God anytime we want. And Lord, we are so thankful to be gathered here today and to have intellectual discourse amongst like-minded people, and that we may be united in a singular purpose on May 9th, a singular purpose only, and that we may do our works that be pleasing in your sight. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Sean. Now it's my pleasure to introduce to you Tim Parrish. Tim is chair of the Princeton County Republican Committee, and he lives in the 11th District, but also Tim is a Marine and a veteran, so it's our honor to have him lead us in the in the pledge this evening. Tim? Thank you so much, Madam Chair, for the honor of leading us in the pledge. Uh, Sean has uploaded a flag, so if you guys would place your hand over your heart and join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much, Tim. And now I'm delighted to introduce to you Steve Knotts. Steve is chair of the Fairfax County GOP. He's gonna be reading the Republican Creed for us this evening. Steve? Thank you, Melissa. We believe that the free enterprise system is the most productive supplier of human needs and economic justice, that all individuals are entitled to equal rights, justice, and opportunities, and should assume their responsibilities as citizens in a free society. Fiscal responsibility and budgetary restraints must be exercised at all levels of government, that the federal government must preserve individual liberty by observing constitutional limitations. I'm sure that peace is best preserved through a strong national defense. That faith in God is recognized by our founding fathers is essential to the moral fiber of the nation. Thank you, Steve. 
Before we start this evening's program, it's my pleasure to introduce to you RPV State Chairman Rich Anderson, who will be joining our event this evening all the way from Texas, where he is representing us at the RNC Spring Meeting. Chairman Anderson, we're glad to have you with us. Thank you. Can you hear me, Melissa? You sure can, Mr. Chairman. All right, well, thank you. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Rich Anderson, Chairman of the Republican Party of Virginia. And I'm speaking to you from Dallas, Texas, where I'm here for several days for the spring meeting of the Republican National Committee. And I can tell you my uh, 49 fellow state chairs and others among the 168 who sit on the Republican National Committee are very focused in on this election simply because it's the only one of its kind. And then so the eyes of the country are on us all and on our candidates. The uh, Tonight, you will hear from a half dozen outstanding Virginians and Americans who have offered themselves in public service as candidates for governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia. And in just 17 days, Virginia Republicans will head to the polls at our RPV State Convention on May 8th to make that decision. And so this is a very important occasion in the life of our party and our Commonwealth. So I would like to say thank you to all of you and especially to the chairs of the 8th, 10th and 11th Congressional District Republican Committees for putting on tonight's discussion forum as well as those that have preceded it. And so to my fellow Virginia Republicans, listen up, sit up, take to heart what these candidates have to say, because you can look at the screen and know that one of these individuals who stands before you tonight is going to be elected in November of this year as the governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia and lead our party and our Commonwealth back to greatness. Thank you and let's go to it. Thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Chairman. We're honored to have you with us. To ensure fairness and quality of the forum, the following rules will be strictly enforced this evening. Surrogates will not be allowed to participate in the place of a candidate. Candidates may not participate from a car or vehicle. During the debate, candidates will keep their cameras on at all times. Candidates who drop off from the webinar or join late may retake their place in the rotation, but may not gain back time if they missed an opportunity to speak. No participant in the forum shall be allowed to use props or visuals. Candidates may refer to limited notes as props. Candidates may write notes for their own use throughout the program. No rebuttal or right of reply opportunities will be available at any time. Candidates shall not be allowed to interrupt one another. The moderators, rule committee, and technical team are present to enforce this rule. Also, interruptions may result in a candidate being removed from the forum. If anyone experiences technical issues on their end, they may be dropped from the stream if they correct the problem on their side. All questions are predetermined. No questions will be taken from the virtual audience. Commentary, analysis, or follow-up questions from the moderators will not be permitted. Questions will be answered in rotation. Candidates will have as much of an equal opportunity as possible to be the first, middle, and last to answer a question. Initial ordering will be in alphabetical order by candidates' last names. Each candidate will be allowed a three-minute introduction two minutes to answer each question, 30 seconds to answer each question in the lightning round, and two minutes for closing comments. Each candidate will receive a 30 second warning call and a call of time when their time allotted has elapsed. Each candidate will have five seconds at that point to complete their sentence, then they will be muted. Now, as we begin the forum, it's my pleasure to introduce to you the team that will be facilitating this evening's gubernatorial forum. The moderator from the 11th Congressional District is 11th District State Central Committee Representative Richard McCarty. The moderator representing the 8th Congressional District is Sham Menon, Chair of the Falls Church Republican Committee. The moderator from the 10th Congressional District is 10th District District State Central Representative Ron Wright. Technology and Timekeeper is Sean Rastatter, 
Vice Chair of Fairfax County GLP. And the Rules Committee are 8th and 10th Congressional District Chairs, Gary Higgins and Andrew LaPoser. Now at this time, let's go ahead and get started with the forum. And the first person we'll be uh, introducing you all is Richard McCarty from the 11th Congressional District. Richard? Hello everyone, can you hear me? I'm clear. Very good. Uh, so we'll now begin opening statements um, and we're starting alphabetically. So the first will be uh, Ms. Chase. The floor is yours. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Virginia State Senator Amanda Chase. I'm a wife, I'm a mom, I'm a former small business owner. And listen, it's important that you have an electable candidate. I've been elected twice in a general election. I'm an experienced legislator with a voting record that you can trust. I'm a wife, my husband and I have been married 28 years. We dated for six. Yes, we did meet at Chick-fil-A. And uh, we have four wonderful, amazing kids, Melanie, Joseph, Timothy, and Daniel. They're all grown adults. We can't believe we have kids aged 25 to 19. And so we're very proud parents. Our kids are all grown and out of the house, except for our youngest, Daniel, and uh, he's at Liberty University. I have a lot of education experience in business. I have a degree in business from Virginia Tech, a double majored in corporate finance and business management. I graduated in the top 10% of my class. I uh, also work for such companies that many of you all may be familiar with, First North American National Bank with Circuit Cities Bank. I work for Signet Bank Card and Management, which is now Capital One. I work for the Virginia Student Assistance Authorities under Governor George Allen. And finally, I've also worked in management at the Federal Reserve Bank in Richmond. Friends, I understand fiscal policy. I've been in the private sector. I've been in the public sector. I've been a homeschool parent. My husband and I homeschooled our kids for eight years. We've done private school, public school, and homeschool. That said, I'm also an experienced legislator. I'm serving my second term in the state Senate. I'm known as a firebrand Republican. I know how to get things done. I passed at least three quarters of my legislation that I wanted to get signed into law my first four years I was in office. And um, I have quite a reputation in the, in the state Senate of not only getting things done, but speaking out and being a loud mouth conservative. A lot of people appreciate that. So um, I look forward to uh, answering all of your questions this evening and uh, look forward to your comments. Thank you, Ms. Chase. Uh, Mr. Cox. Richard, thank you so much. I want to thank the 8th, 10th, and 11th districts for this forum. So Kirk Cox was a 30-year U.S. and Virginia government teacher, only thing I ever wanted to do. Uh, and the reason for that is what a great opportunity to teach students about this incredible experiment in representative democracy. And that was the love of my life. I was also a coach. And I think that's important for this reason. Uh, I'm as middle class as you get and come from sort of that working class background, which I think is going to be extremely important in this race. So I go on and I run for the House of Delegates. Now, we often hear about career politicians, and I find it very interesting that we are a citizen legislature. Remember, we're only in session part time, and we make the astounding figure of about $17,640 a year. That's the model the founders envisioned, which I think is great. So I was a teacher. We have cattle farmers. We actually had a tree surgeon at one time. So that's the way things should be. So what sort of sets Kirk Cox apart? I've always said, Teddy Roosevelt said it best, I've been the man in the arena. During those 32 years, I worked my way up to majority leader. Remember, your caucus elects you as majority leader. They see you as the most effective debater. And then the honor of being the 55th speaker. And I did something very unusual when I was speaker, and I think it typifies, hopefully, my leadership. When Kathy Trom put a bill in that would made abortion up until birth legal, remember, that's probably about the worst bill we've had in 32 years, I left the podium for the first time in 60 years, gave a speech from the floor as a speaker. And I said the following, as long as I have a microphone, I'll stand up for life. Then I really wanted them to feel, you know, what it meant to pass a bill like that. So I quoted my favorite Old Testament biblical character, King David, who said, you created my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And we defeated that bill. The speaker also cut taxes by a billion dollars one of the safest states in the nation. And of course, we did a tremendous job as far as freezing tuition for the first time in 20 years. So quickly, what happened? You know this, the Democrats happened. 
uh, we became California very quickly. Higher taxes, Green New Deal, the pandemic failures. Folks, this is our one chance to stop all that. We've got to fight back against the silencing and shaming where you can't even have an all-star game. You can't even play baseball without having council culture. We've got to fight back against these collective policies, against a worldview that government controls everything. We've got to lead forward. We've got to have great jobs. We've got to have affordable college and credentials. And most of all, we've got to have honesty and integrity. So that's why I'm running for governor. I look forward very much to this forum tonight. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Cox. Uh, Mr. De La Pena. Uh, you seem to be on mute. How's that? Much better. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you tonight. I'm, I'm running for governor because I want to protect the American dream. The American dream began in Virginia because she's the cradle of the American experiment that's created the greatest good and opportunity for the world in the history of humanity. And I'm proof of that because I've lived that American dream. And the uniqueness of my story is that I'm not unique because everybody in the United States has the opportunity to live the American dream or know someone who has. That dream is under assault by the governor and general assembly in Richmond. That dream is one that we've got to maintain. We've already know all the horrible things that they're doing because all of those bad ideas are now being tried out at the national level. So a little bit about me, I came uh, from Mexico, I was born in a house of dirt floors, no running water. Got here legally when I was five years old, started picking cotton when I was 10. I uh, had 20 jobs before I joined the Army, spent 30 years in the Army, retired as a colonel. And then in 2016, while other Republicans were sitting on the sidelines, I joined President Trump's campaign to win over Hispanic voters. I did 60 interviews in Spanish, and we got 29% of the Hispanic votes. Two weeks after the election, I was invited by President Trump to join the transition team in the Pentagon. And a few months later, I was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense responsible for defense policy of this half of the globe. So what is it that we need to do to win? We must win, it is essential. We keep putting forth the same type of candidates and we keep losing. We keep losing because we're not expanding the voting base. We've got to reach out two communities that we've not reached out to before. We've got to reach out to the immigrant communities. I can reach out to the Hispanic community, communities because I am that Hispanic. I can reach out to the Asian communities because I know what they go through when they live under communist regimes because I've been in 60 countries all over the world and I know what that's like. Nobody else can. I can reach out to the military communities because I am that soldier. I can reach out to federal service employees because I've worked as a federal employee and I can reach out to the rest of the Commonwealth because I've had that experience working in the fields all the way through the highest levels of the government. So if you want to win, you've got to win in Northern Virginia. The demographics have changed. You've got 20% of Hispanics in Northern Virginia and you've got another 60% or 16%, 17% of Asians. We've got to reach out to those communities if we're going to win. We're, our campaign is on a fire. Uh, we've been able to get the lowest number of low dollar donors, and we are continuing to get more and more voters coming our way. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. De La Pena. Uh, Peter Duran, are you out there? He was having difficulty. So I guess we will move on to Ms. Johnson. Floor is yours. But what I'm Peter, Peter, I think you're unmuted. Maybe you could just try and uh, speak to us if you can't turn your camera on. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Republicans, this is Peter Duran. I'm Hello? Republicans, this is Peter Duran. I'm going to talk with you this evening about my vision. We're gonna get the tech issue sorted out. I'm not gonna delay our discussion any further. Uh, we'll get the camera on here shortly. Uh, we'll talk some, we'll, I'm gonna share my vision about how we're gonna be number one in the country for school choice. Uh, we're gonna be number one in the country when it comes to uh, phasing out our state income tax, and we're gonna get critical race theory out of the classrooms. That's the vision I'm sharing with you this evening. We'll get the camera working shortly. 
Thank you, Mr. Duran. Uh, Ms. Johnson. Good evening. I'm Octavia Johnson, and I'm the former sheriff of Roanoke City. And it was an honor for me to, sh to serve as sheriff of Roanoke City from 2006 to 2013. And as sheriff of Roanoke City, I moved it into the 21st century. And I was a deputy with the Roanoke City Sheriff's Office for 26 years before I ran for sheriff of Roanoke City. And I ran because it was not moving in the direction that I thought that the sheriff's office should move in. So I ran against my boss because I wanted change to happen. And for change to happen, you have to be willing to jump out the boat. So I jumped out the boat and I ran against my boss because I wanted to make a difference. And I ran against a democratic machine. The muscle machine is what they called him. I ran and I was successful and I made the changes in the Roanoke City Sheriff's Office that needed to be made. And it was a pleasure to serve the citizens of Roanoke and to provide a safe and secure environment for them. And as Sheriff of Roanoke City, we became law enforcement accredited. I initiated and established uh, a citizens academy for the citizens of this great city could see how the Roanoke City Sheriff's Office operated. I uh, established a standards, professional standards unit to make sure that the Roanoke City Sheriff's Office was operating at a level that it needed to be operated in. I also implemented a use of force uh, committee. So we were policing ourselves. And as Sheriff of Roanoke City, I led the department with integrity and, and creativity. And I am running for governor of this great state because there needs to be changes made. I come out of retirement to run for governor because I did not like what was going on in this great state, how they were the pro-life, how Governor Northam, his views. I mean, he is a doctor. Uh, our first and second amendments our, our forefathers fought for us, the foundation of this great commonwealth. We are one of the first 13 colonies. Ms. Johnson, your time is up. All right, thank you. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Uh, Pete Snyder. Good evening, Nova Republicans. I am fired up to be with you tonight and I am fired up to take down Terry in November. I don't know if you've seen Terry lately. It is remarkable. Terry McAuliffe and the Democrats are coming at me nearly every single day, over 25 times in the past two weeks alone. And we know why. They're scared. Inside Nova, and even Senator Chap Peterson said that I am the Republican Democrats fear the most in 2021. And they have reason to because like you, they know that I'm not a career politician, that I'm an innovator, I'm a job creator, I am a disruptor who will shake Richmond to its very core. And there's a reason why good Northern Virginia conservatives like Ken Cuccinelli and Ginny Thomas, Dick Black, Dave LaRock and Morton Blackwell are all backing me because they know I will be a fearless fighter for our values. Uh, and Virginia is caught in a horrible place right now. I believe we are in the worst crisis that we've seen in over 100 years, and the folks in charge haven't gotten the job done. So in a crisis, you keep the main thing the main thing. So when I'm the next governor of Virginia, I'm gonna focus immediately on three things. Number one, we are going to get our schools all around Virginia open five days a week, every single week, with a real live breathing teacher in every single classroom. But opening our schools is just the beginning. 
We need to provide parents and students with real choice and charter schools. And as your next governor, I am going to clip the purse strings of every single locality that puts this ridiculous critical race theory and racist 1619 project in our classrooms. Secondly, on day one, I am going to open up our economy. I am going to rid these executive orders and mandates that have crippled small businesses. So many of y'all in Northern Virginia worked with me and my wife, Burson, on the Virginia 30 Day Fund. And together we helped save nearly a thousand small businesses all around the Commonwealth, 300 in Northern Virginia alone. Together, we will rebuild our economy. And lastly, I'm gonna do something a little radical for woke Terry. I am actually going to prioritize the rights of law abiding citizens such as yourselves above those of criminals. Who would have thought we need to defend our First Amendment rights, our religious freedoms, our Second Amendment rights. We need to protect the sanctity of life and I will take on and take down this ridiculous cancel culture that is violating the rights of Virginians every day. Folks, I am fired up and this former wrestler can't wait to take Terry McAuliffe down in November. Join me in the fight. Thank you all so much. And I look forward to your questions. Thanks, Mr. Schneider. Mr. Youngkin. Thank you so much to the uh, 8th, 10th, and 11th uh, Congressional District Committees for hosting tonight. I'm Glenn Youngkin, and I'm running for governor. I'm a Christian. I'm a conservative. I'm an outsider. I am the only real outsider in this race. I'm a successful business leader, and I know how to build business and create jobs. And I'm a Republican who can and will win in November. We all know what's going on right now. We can absolutely see that we're in a moment like none other because we're seeing it in Washington and we have seen it in Virginia for the last eight years that elections have consequences and the consequences have been crushing. But we also feel what's happening. Republicans are coming together like never before. I've traveled 17,000 miles in the last 13 weeks and met with thousands of Virginians. And I hear it over and over again. We must win. We will win. And Glenn, we're for you. I'm a homegrown Virginian. I love this Commonwealth. And the Democrats have put her in the ditch and we must rescue her. But we must come together to do it. And we will do it through addition and multiplication, not subtraction and division. Our campaign has huge momentum. The middle resolution endorsement last week was humbling, but important. We have nearly 17,000 delegates who signed up to support us. We had the strongest fundraising report last week. And Monday night, we finished so strong with nearly 47% of the votes at the Liberty University Straw Pro. But this is not about me, it's about us. We will win together. And with Glenn Youngkin at the top of the ticket, we will get this done and we will put Virginia back where she belongs as the best state in America. When I have the privilege of going to work for all of you as your governor, day one, Virginia will be open. Our businesses, our schools, our houses of worship, we will rebuild, reinvigorate this economy like never before. We'll build a rip-roaring economy and turn back on our job machine. We'll cut taxes, but we're also gonna stand up and protect our constitutional rights because they've been violated like never before. We have to, yes, make sure our churches are open. We have to protect our freedom of speech. We have to stand up to big tech. We will protect our second amendment rights. I'm a gun owner, I'm a lifetime member of the NRA and we will stand for our second amendment rights. And I am pro-life. If we don't protect the unborn, then who will? We will not only open our schools, we will press forward aggressively with charter schools and education savings accounts. We will make sure law enforcement knows that we will have their back. And finally, we will press forward with aggressive election reforms, including showing up to vote with a picture ID. Friends, we will get this done. We will win in November. Join me. We have a ton of momentum and I cannot wait to be your governor. Thanks, Mr. Yunkin. Uh, Sham, the floor is yours. Good evening, candidates. 
for the first question, you all will have two minutes each to respond. The candidate order will be Cox, De La Pena, Duran, Johnson, Snyder, Yunkin, and Chase. Here's the question. While COVID has been at the center of our lives for over a year, Democrats have spent much of the past year focusing on issues such as alternative energy, with the Virginia Clean Economy Act, changing election law, marijuana legalization, and the like. As governor, how would you reorient the political conversation to issues such as opening schools, saving small business, and returning Virginia to normalcy after the pandemic? Mr. Cox. It's a great question. The first thing I would do to return to normal is in the scandals, be honest and transparent and results oriented. You know, it's a great question because if you look back to last July during the special session, when I was calling back then for the reopening schools, the Democrats had no interest in that issue whatsoever. They were focused on defunding the police. And we all know the media didn't help. They sort of parroted that line. They amplified those issues. You know, a governor has a real responsibility to be a leader. He's also got to use what I call the bully pulpit, and that is something that you can effectively use. And let's, so let's start with your question, schools. Uh, the first thing we have to do is obviously open them up. We got to do a lot more than that. We got to deal with learning loss. I have a plan to uh, deal with that. Think, you've got kids right now that Fs are up by 350%. So I've called for intense tutoring. I've, talked, I've called for opting into summer school, which I think is very important. Career in tech for small business, they need, frankly, the education lab where the jobs are. We need to make the dignity of welding and being a CDL driver very, very important. I think also for all small business, uh, I cut regulations by 20% at DPOR and uh, criminal justice services. We need to do that for every single business. The governor, the Democrat governors have buried about 50 positions, think about that, from the Department of Labor and DEQ into our budget with nothing but got you positions to hurt small business. And as governor, I certainly will not do that. And I'm going to go grab the front part of your question. We can't run away from those issues the Democrats have tried to grab. I'll give you a quick one, the Clean Economy Act. We need to tell folks that we're the one that put $500 million into the bay on point source pollution to clean it up. And things like the Clean Economy Act will cost the average taxpayer $800 a year. That's not cleaning up the economy. So you'll see Kirk Cox both take on some of their issues and promote issues that obviously Republicans and all of Virginia will love. Mr. Della Pena. Well, thank you very much. It's a great question. The first thing I would do is before the election is we have to get everybody energized to be able to look at election integrity. We've got to get as many voters out as possible and we've got to motivate everybody and all the candidates have to do that. And I've been talking to everybody that, I, that I've had an opportunity to, to talk to about get, making sure that it becomes a massive turnout because we've got to make sure that we have election integrity and it's going to take all Republicans all throughout the Commonwealth. Once, we, once I'm into office, I would start by doing elect, election reform because we got to do that first because we have to anchor the fidelity of our institutions because without it, we can't get there. The next thing is you got to open up the economy. We have to get the economy going. I have to make sure that all of these ideas about keeping schools closed go away. You've got to, we have to open up the schools. I will make sure that we open up the economy and then we need to start looking at providing parents the ability to send their kids wherever they want to have them in school. Open up more opportunities for homeschooling, vouchers, just look across the board, private schools. We need to, we need to look at how our Second Amendment is being attacked. We've been piecemealing the gun-free zones in certain counties. And I want to make sure that at that ends because we have a Second Amendment for a reason. That, that, that Second Amendment is something that is a national right for everybody. And we need to make sure that we get everything back on track and we've got to return to normal. We, we were the pride of the nation across the board and we've lost that. All of us have agreed to that and all of us have the same position. I will make sure that we get back to where we are focused on strong families, meaningful work, and 
and uh, making sure that we do it in a, an environment of freedom. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bain. Mr. Duran. Thank you very much. Look, I think the issue here is very clear. If we are going to lead as Republicans, then you have to have a vision. You have to be able to put forward a winning vision that you can rally all of Virginia around. And what we're seeing here this evening, I don't mean any negativity or any disrespect to the other very fine gubernatorial candidates we have, but what we're seeing here is the problem. This is not an option. Republicans, we must go forward with a vision for me. As I've said, many of you heard me, Virginia should be the best. And if we're gonna be the best, that means we're gonna be number one in schools. Yeah, number one in safety, sure. Number one in jobs. What, is exa what exactly does that mean? We've heard a lot of slogans so far in this campaign, but there's not a lot of specifics. Specifically, what I would do, because we're gonna be number one, we're gonna phase out the state income tax in Virginia and go to 0%. I'm the only candidate in this race who has said, we are gonna phase out the state income tax because that is what our Republican ideals say we should do. And we know we can do this because there's a better way. But also, if we're gonna be the best, yeah, I'm pro-life, but we need to be pro-family in Virginia. That's why I've said we are gonna be the first state in the country to have paid bereavement leave for state employees who have suffered a miscarriage. For mothers, their husbands, and their partners, we're gonna have six paid days of bereavement leave so that families have time to heal. Families have time to focus on what's important. Do you see the difference? Because many other these wonderful candidates who you have to choose who you're gonna support on May 8th, yeah, they've got a lot of very good ideas and they're, they're putting out their slogans, but Terry McAuliffe, he's put out a vision. It's a bad vision. Terry McAuliffe, he's put out his specifics. And if we are gonna beat Terry McAuliffe this November, we have to show a clear and compelling alternative to the vision and the specifics that Democrats are putting forward. So we're gonna phase out the state income tax and rally all of Virginia around our winning Republican vision that Virginia should be the best. Ms. Johnson. Thank you. As governor, my concern is the citizens of this great commonwealth. So I would dispel the fear that the Democrats have placed on these, on the citizens of Virginia with the COVID. We know that COVID does exist and we know things happen, but we also know that the numbers that they reported are not true. And then every day, throwing those numbers into the face of the citizens. So they took away all hope, replaced it with fear. They took away the good and replaced it with evil. So therefore I would speak to the citizens of, of this great Commonwealth to dispel that and give them hope and then let them know the direction that we together will make changes that are better for this great Commonwealth. And that would be to open our economy or uh, to send our children back to school. When I retired, I took care of my two nieces. They're three and five. And when it was time for Jasera to go to preschool, her mother and I, we were talking about it and I told Jessica, she has to go to a place where she is safe, secure, and that the curriculum is agreeable with our morals and standard of living. And then we have to open the schools, the economy, uh, voter integrity, make sure that the people can vote and that they have picture ID when they Johnson, go to vote. Up. And, but that's what I would do, dispel fear and let the citizens of this great state have hope again. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Thank you. Mr. Schneider. I'm gonna do something a little radical as a conservative running for the Republican nomination. I'm actually gonna quote a Democrat. In the middle of the General Assembly session last earlier this year, 
uh, a leading Democrat in the state Senate, was quoted to the Richmond Times-Dispatch when asked about the priorities of the Democratic leadership. And this person said, if you look at what we're doing, legalizing marijuana, making a misdemeanor to assault a police officer, ridding the scourge of the earth of styrofoam and balloons, you would never know that we are in the middle of a pandemic. It is absolutely absurd what the Democrats and the radicals in Richmond have been up to for the past year. And you know it's even more absurd when Richmond makes Washington look conservative. This crazy train needs to end. And if Terry McAuliffe gets four more years, we are going right over the rails. And we can't afford that. That's why I've been laser focused in this campaign from the very beginning. I always say that in a crisis, you got to make the main thing the main thing. The very fundamentals of government fell down on the job last year. We have a constitutional requirement to educate our children in Virginia. And guess what? Most of the Commonwealth took a flyer on that last year. It is ridiculous. We need to open up our schools five days a week, every week, with a real live teacher in every classroom. Secondly, this, these shutdowns have destroyed the lives of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people all across the Commonwealth. We need to reopen our economy and get rid of these unconstitutional executive orders. And lastly, we do need to prioritize the rights of law-abiding citizens, our right to have a free and fair election. We are gonna make Georgia look ridiculous and we're gonna make Virginia number one in the nation with our uh, fair election laws, voter ID, matching signatures, only US citizens participating. We need to fight for our constitutional rights. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Mr. Snyder. Mr. Youngkin. Yes, thank you. How are we going to reorient the political conversation? That is the question. And the answer is, first, we're gonna go win. And we're gonna win not just a governor's race, we're gonna win the lieutenant governor's race and the attorney general's race because Virginians are coming together like never before, not just Republicans, but all Virginians. I've heard it from all Republicans, I've heard it from independents, and I'll tell you, I'm starting to hear it from Democrats as well. They cannot afford Terry McAuliffe either. If right to work goes away in this state, Virginia is cooked and they know it. So we are actually coming together as Virginians, but not just for the statewide offices. We're gonna win back at least six of our House of Delegate seats, and we're gonna win back local seats all over Virginia. This is why we started Virginia Wins. We started Virginia Wins and have funded in already $400,000 to back school board races, supervisory board races, sheriff races, Commonwealth attorney races, delegate seats, treasurer seats, because we are not gonna have a lonely victory in November. We're gonna bring a whole crop of Republicans with us, conservative voices, and that's where we're gonna start changing the political conversation. And then we're gonna move forward, getting Virginia open. We're gonna stand up for our constitutional rights, not on defense, but on offense. We're absolutely going to stand up for police. We're gonna, we're gonna move forward with school choice and charter schools and we are gonna press ahead with reforms, aggressive reforms of our election process to reestablish people's faith in our election process. Friends, this is about having an aggressive agenda that we can put into motion as opposed to being on defense. I'm tired of Republicans losing. We're running a differentiated kind of campaign and we are gonna take back our great Commonwealth in November and put Virginia back where she belongs as the best state in America. Ms. Chase. Well, good evening, everyone. Listen, I, under COVID, would have never closed our schools. I never would have closed down our businesses. And I have always said from the beginning that we should educate, not mandate. It should never be a class one misdemeanor. No matter whether you choose not to wear a mask, whether you don't get the vaccine, you should never be discriminated against because you refuse to go against an overreaching government. Listen, I, in the Virginia Senate, I have been a leading voice. Remember when COVID occurred, it happened right after the gun grab, right after we finished our, fir our first general assembly session after the liberal majority took over the House 
the Senate, and we already had Governor Northam. And immediately after we closed session, we had to make a decision about the budget. It was at that particular point, friends, that we had major decisions. We could be quiet as Republicans or we could be outspoken. Friends, I chose to be outspoken and I said, do not close down our state. Do not close down our schools. We need to keep it open. Now, I agreed with the president's 15 day stop the spread. But friends, 15 days was over a year ago and yet here we are. I actually co-sponsored legislation that would end a governor's emergency powers. After 30 days, that decision needs to go to the General Assembly and I co-patron legislation to end that. To reopen our schools, friends, I passed legislation last year that it would allow us this coming fall to actually reopen our schools legally. It's called the Labor Day Bill, putting an end to the King's Dominion Law that states that our schools have to, or have the ability, the localities have the ability to reopen two weeks prior to Labor Day. I would reintroduce my bill, Senate Bill 5020, that said if a locality chooses to shut down our schools and go 100% online, that money goes into an education voucher and is given to our parents in the form of an education voucher um, for our schools, homeschooling, alternative education, or private education. Thank you, candidates. Now I'll turn the floor over to Ron for the second question. Thanks. Um, good evening, candidates. I appreciate all of you coming together and thank you for your commitment to conservative principles and I hope we can all come together after the May 8th election. Um, so just a reminder, two minutes, um, and we'll start off with the question. In April of 2020, Governor Northam signed five bills into law uh, imposing, hold on one second, excuse me, imposing a variety of restrictions on the possession and of and transactions involving firearms, including a red flag law. As governor, what gun legislation would you support that would simultaneously protect the safety and the constitutional rights of Virginians? We will start out with uh, Mr. Dave LaPena. Uh, two minute answer, please. Thank you very much, Ron. The Second Amendment is something that's unique to the United States. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bill of rights. That right means that it covers every state, every commonwealth. It's something that is near and dear to all Americans. And the reason that it's near and dear to all Americans is because it's enshrined in the state seal that says, tyrants beware. It's a check on tyranny. It's what we use to ensure that government does not overreach. That right is one that should not be abridged. It's one that must be given to all Americans. We have to ensure that all Americans have that opportunity to bear arms because that's what the Constitution says. If we're going to be a constitutional country, then we need to make sure that we follow that. And the Commonwealth is no exception. We've allowed counties to start piecemealing the way that they believe that that amendment should be dictated, and that is wrong. So what we need to do is make sure that we challenge that in court if necessary, but we just say the Commonwealth is going to abide by the Second Amendment, we're gonna defend it, and we're gonna make sure that it stays that way. You've seen the bad ideas that they've been trotted out in the Commonwealth, and now they're applied nationwide. Look at what our senators are now proposing for national legislation. I went to purchase a gun at the Marine Corps PX. I had bought a Sig Sauer. I went back to buy a second one two weeks later, I said, no, you can't. I was, and then I was reminded that in Virginia, you can only buy a gun a month. Now that is becoming a national policy. That's not something that is enshrined in the Constitution. That is a ridiculous restriction. Red flag laws allow for our government to be able to selectively pick who they can go after for whatever reason. It gives too much arbitrary power to government. That's not what our system was designed to be. Our government was to free people to have the least amount of government so we can function most effectively. I am a strict opponent or, of, of any restrictions on the Second Amendment, so thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Mr. Duran. Thank you. All right, so again, this is where I keep coming to the point, you have to have a vision. And I think we're starting to see 
the slogans fly fast and furious, but we need to be specific about what it is we're going to do as Republicans in order to win. So, of course, I think every single one of our Republican candidates, we are fierce and strong defenders of the Second Amendment. I certainly am. If we're going to be the best state in the country, that means we are going to be the best state in the country when it comes to protecting your sacred Second Amendment rights. What does that mean? Well, as governor, we are going to be a constitutional commonwealth. I'm going to make us a constitutional commonwealth and do the governor's job. For too long, we've had Democrats who haven't been doing their job. So if Joe Biden signs an executive order uh, that violates your constitutional rights, if Nancy Pelosi and AOC and the Democrats in Washington, D.C. Uh, pass a law that goes after your Second Amendment here in Virginia, we're going to say no. And we are not going to enforce those laws here. And if Nancy Pelosi and Joe Biden get upset about that, well, we're going to tell them, go fly a kite because we are a, a constitutional commonwealth here in Virginia under my administration, and we'll meet them in court, and we'll win. You see, Virginians, that's the governor's job. For too long, Democrats have not been doing their job. They have not been protecting your rights, and you need a governor who wakes up every single morning and says, I am here for one purpose, and that is to enforce our Virginia constitution, and enforce our federal constitution and make sure that laws don't impede on your rights. If we're, if you, if we're gonna have a vision for how we're gonna lead, I say Virginia should be the best and we are gonna be number one in the country for protecting your second amendment rights and we're gonna do it by being a constitutional commonwealth. That's the governor's job. Thank you, Mr. Rand. Uh, Ms. Johnson, you're up next, please. Thank you. Uh, my father was a gun owner. He had two rifles and he used them in the fall of the year quite a bit, honey. My husband is a gun owner. He loves to go out uh, target shooting. I have friends that are gun owners. And every time that the state wants to go putting in new laws, what do the people do? They get upset. They run to the gun stores, buy up all the guns. When people start putting into laws that are basically unconstitutional because the constitution says we have the right to bear arms or to protect ourselves and our property. And they are bent on chipping away at taking our laws from us. So, we have to start changing, putting in laws or dispelling the laws that have been put in place to correct what has been done because we have the right to bear arms to protect ourselves. And as your governor, that's what Octavia Johnson will do. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Snyder, you're up next. Thank you, Ron. You know, Joe Biden, I'm gonna tell you, the Second Amendment is absolute and we will defend it to the hilt in Virginia. You know, if there's ever a poster child on why we have a Second Amendment in America and in Virginia, and why it's sacred, it was last year, the year 2020, when our capital city of Richmond was literally run by a mob for the better part of what, four to six weeks? It was absolute insanity and it was wrong. And why did that happen? Well, Terry McAuliffe had a former political operative that he got elected and installed as the mayor of our capital city in Richmond. And Mayor LeVar Stoney told the police to stand down. And that will never happen on my watch when I'm governor. Specifically, Ron, what I will do is have legislation that will get rid of all of the restrictions, will repeal all of the restrictions brought on by Governor Northam in the extremists in Richmond. Red flag laws, I'm sorry, there is no due process in red flag laws. They are wrong. And if you want to see our constitution further shredded, just get four more years of Terry McAuliffe and the insanity that's going on in Richmond. We will take a hard line. And again, that's why Democrats don't want me as our nominee. 
they're taking shots at me every single day because I'm the only Republican that they're scared of. I'm the only one they know that can take down Terry McAuliffe and bring real conservative change to Richmond. This is not a solo act. I'm bringing a posse with me called a conservative majority in the House of Delegates and a conservative attorney general. And we are going to be partners in governance and re restore our constitutional rights in the Commonwealth of Virginia. All right, thank you. Mr. Youngkin, you're up next. Yes, thank you. So let's first start with the question, which was what second amendment legislation would you support? And I think we need to be really clear, none. We, we have to actually stand up against all of the legislation that has been passed by the Democrats. And the way we're gonna do this is not by complaining from the sidelines, but by winning in November and turning around and winning enough delegate seats to in fact make sure that our second amendment rights can in fact exist as opposed to being encroached upon. Now I, I'm a gun owner, I'm a lifetime member of the NRA. I understand what it means for the people to have the right to keep and bear arms. And as your governor, we will not just stand up, but we will push back, but we will push back. But the second part of this question is about safety. And I think one of the biggest problems we have around the second amendment is that people's misunderstanding of where the problem is. And the problem is in fact with criminals and with mental health. And let me just cover mental health for a minute. Virginia has, and America has, a mental health crisis. And Virginia has had such a terrible, terrible track record of understanding how to deal with our mental health crisis. I hear it from sheriffs who are endorsing me all over the Commonwealth, that the biggest challenge they have right now is the amount of time they spend dealing with mental health issues as opposed to actually policing. So we are gonna have to protect our second amendment rights but also move forward with criminal justice and put people in jail who belong in jail and keep them there. And we're gonna have to reinvent our mental health system with more capacity, with forcing the insurance companies to cover it and relieving our law enforcement heroes from the obligation of absolutely being mental health officers as opposed to law enforcement officers. I can't wait to be your governor and press forward with these topics. Thank you, Mr. Young. Thank you. Senator Chase. Well, this is one of my favorite topics. <laughs> they don't call me Annie Oakley in the Senate for no reason. Let me tell you, I have led the fight in the Senate of Virginia for the past six years. I would eliminate universal background checks. I don't think it's the government's business to know how many guns we own, what kind of guns we own. I would eliminate red flag laws. They do deny due process. I would get rid of one gun a month. I would eliminate giving localities the ability to create gun-free zones and disarming law-abiding citizens. And friends, I would also tell you that in this last session, the liberal Democrats came after our gun rights even there at the Capitol, personally coming after we legislators like myself who carry. Friends, I have 100% rating lifetime score with the Virginia Citizens Defense League and I'm the only candidate running that has that record. I have an A rating with the NRA and I was one of two legislators asked to speak by the pro-Virginia gun group, the Virginia Citizen Citizens Defense League, to address more than 80,000 Virginians who were present in January of 2020. Why is that? Because I'm a staunch defender of our Second Amendment I have a voting record and friends, voting records matter, especially in a time when not all Republicans are created equally. We unfortunately, even in this day and time, have Republicans who are voting with Democrats on some of, some of the gun control legislation. You all know I will be a fierce defender, just like I was on House Bill 961 when I had a conversation with Delegate Mark Levine and talked him down from a, a felony charge to a misdemeanor charge or today we would have all been felons had I not been able to talk him off the ledge. So you can count on me as your next governor and standing strongly for the Second Amendment. All right, thank you. Uh, and batting cleanup, we have Delegate Cox, please. Thank you, Ron. Um, 
First of all, I refuse to believe that you have to choose between safety and constitutional rights. I, I reject that premise. And I think that's an important point. And let me reference a Mark Levine bill. He put a bill in this year on the original form that would basically ban guns, not only at the Capitol, but driving down Brawl Street, walking down the sidewalk. And here's the worst part of the bill, even going to your parking garage. So here you are, you're any delegate, but a female delegate, and you cannot even carry dark at night. We a lot of times left at 10, 11 o'clock at night. And so what I mean by that is that's a safety issue and a constitutional right issue. And I think for so many suburban women, et cetera, for frame issues in that way, you'll win that battle, which is very important. So let's talk, I hear so much about standing up to uh, Terry McAuliffe. Well, I was the majority leader who actually debated on the floor. And one of the reasons Terry McAuliffe is running, he'll tell you, because this will tell you the Republican legislature killed all this stuff. And that was this gun control stuff too. And so I've actually, once again, been in the arena, just not running a campaign and say, I'll stand up to Terry McAuliffe. And so whether that be concealed carry reciprocity, whether that's storing firearms, in people's cars at your place of work. We push all those things through. Please also remember the veto pen and the threat of the veto pen will be very, very big. And we do need to repeal those laws. And I would say of the laws mentioned, probably the one that gives localities control over our constitutional rights is the worst. But I do want to hit on both the behavioral health and the school safety issue. It is key and we need to argue that issue. We need same day access. We need to make sure that uh, which is very important that people that are in crisis can be seen right away. And as far as school safety goes, I chaired one of the first school safety committees, special committees ever. And the thing, we didn't allow gun control to be talked about. We talked about putting more SROs in schools. The Democrats have done exactly the opposite. Let's have real solutions to this, this problem. It really allows us to have safety, not just this uh, anti-Second Amendment rhetoric. Great. Right. Thank you, and I it's uh, turn it over to Richard for the next question. Thanks. Uh, the question is, one of Nova's biggest challenges is traffic congestion. New construction, including the I-95 hot lanes and I-66 hot lanes, have focused on toll roads having high tolls. As governor, what specific steps would you take to improve Nova's clogged transportation arteries without imposing high tolls on commuters? Uh, you'll have two minutes each, and we'll begin with Mr. Duran. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. You know, this is where I get very excited. Uh, when we look at Northern Virginia, I, I live in Northern Virginia, I'm in Arlington. I think you can see a little bit of our Arlington sky right behind me now. We have a problem in Northern Virginia, and that's there's too many people who live here, and too many people are trying to get around and on too few roads. But what is the bigger issue? The bigger issue is they have to use their cars to get around and they have to live here because a lot of people in Northern Virginia work for the federal government. They work for our industries in Arlington, Fairfax County, Alexandria, exact, et cetera. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm the only candidate with big ideas and the biggest idea that I put forward is that we are going to be number one in the country when it comes to building out a hyperloop. Well, think about what that means. This is Elon Musk's vision for high-speed ground transportation. This would cut travel times between Front Royal and Arlington County down to seven minutes. You could live in Roanoke and have a 30-minute ride to Arlington, to Washington, D.C. People will no longer be tied to where they work, and that will dictate where they live. We go to number one in Hyperloop, number one in the country for high-speed tra transportation, not 19th century solutions like the Democrats are offering, but 22nd century solutions that will fundamentally change our commonwealth. It'll create huge, high-tech, long-term jobs, and it will knit our commonwealth together and put Virginia at the center of a hub of six different states. When I say that Virginia should be the best, I mean it, and we're talking about big ideas that Democrats can't match us on because Democrats are too tied to the old ideas. They've shown us they're all out of ideas. If we're gonna be number one in the country, if we're gonna solve our transportation problems here in Virginia, we are gonna build the first Hyperloop. Virginia last century, we were the last state in the country to give up steam. We are gonna be the first state in the country for Hyperloop because we should be the best. Thanks, Mr. Duran. Uh, Ms. Johnson. Thank you. Well, Mr. Duran, that sounds really good. But uh, here in Roanoke, we have a big problem with Interstate 81. 
the traffic and accidents that go on on 81. So I understand that Northern Virginia would have a problem also, but we need the money to take care of both areas, Northern Virginia and 81. They've been trying to take care of this problem for years and we are still, and it still has not been taken care of. So it looks like money is the answer for uh, to settle each one of these problems is, and where do we get it from to, to take care of Northern Virginia and Interstate 81 here in Roanoke? So I guess we would have to put together a council or group of people to study, let's get the money and let's and what works for both places. Maybe what Mr. Duran has put out there, maybe that's a good idea. But see, to correct and get things fixed, jump out the box and put everybody together like Mr. Duran's question, what he suggested and come up with a masterpiece to take care of it all. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Johnson. Uh, Mr. Schneider. Sure, as a business owner and a longtime resident in Northern Virginia for over 20 years, I know firsthand the impact that traffic and congestion have on your family life, on your work life, on, on building a business, and it's been horrible for years, uh, and it needs to be fixed. But we need to, to give some truths out here, which is the transportation tax bill in 2013 uh, that, that was agreed upon by Republicans has been a complete and utter disaster. We have projects that are running costing double, triple, four times the original costs that were expected. We actually sold off roads to private companies and we were promised that we would have deals that, that would keep tolls low, uh, but no one looked at the fine print of those deals. Uh, and in two consecutive governorships in a row, we created horrible deals on roads that have just penalized Northern Virginia commuters. Uh, I wanna get rid of all toll roads in Virginia. I wanna make sure that we are working with the federal government. You know, Ralph Northam uh, got elected in 2017 when he won his primary by taking shots at President Trump uh, and saying that he would never work with them. That's ridiculous. You know what? I disagree with Joe Biden on a million and one different things. But you know, I will work with folks to better transportation in Virginia so long as we can say no to new gas taxes and no to any new taxes by the General Assembly. I'm happy to work with Washington to help fix Northern Virginia transportation problems. But the answer isn't dumping more money into Metro. It's making sure that we actually put money back into the pockets of Northern Virginia commuters. Thanks, Mr. Schneider. Uh, Mr. Youngkin. Yes, as I've traveled around this great Commonwealth, this issue of congestion and traffic and infrastructure isn't just Northern Virginia. It's everywhere. I've heard it in Hampton Roads. Octavia's described it in, in, in uh, Roanoke in Southwest Virginia. So let's just be clear. Virginia is so far behind on our infrastructure that we are struggling to compete with states around us every day. And so let's first step back. We have to get rural broadband moving across this great commonwealth. By the way, politicians in Richmond are still thinking about 20-year-old technology. And by looking up and thinking about low-orbit satellites that are low cost, we can go right now. What does that unlock? That actually unlocks the entire commonwealth for people to live and work. We don't have to drive in every day. We've proven that. We absolutely have to be where we want to live. And therefore, we can, in fact, have businesses that are growing and thriving with their employees all over the Commonwealth. I do think that what's coming out of Washington today as an infrastructure bill is silly because there's very little infrastructure in it. We need to recognize that investing in our roads is something that we must do in order to expand capacity, but we also has to have to re reduce the overall volume. And the best way to do that is to make all of Virginia attractive to live in, for people to have 
high speed internet access, low cost, for people to have an infrastructure of highway systems like an expanded 495, like an, ex like an expanded 81, like an I-73. These, these projects must move forward, but we can do this by in fact managing our budgets in Richmond so much better. I've got a 30 year business career and what I see every time is, is waste and inefficiency. And we can do it within the $67 billion that Virginia spends every year without new taxes, without new We can get this done. Thanks, Mr. Yunkin. Ms. Chase. Well, listen, I think there are certainly long-term, short-term, and mid-term solutions. Let's talk about what we're currently doing. So sitting on the Senate Transportation Committee, I just want to say that SmartScale is a, a great program that began in about two, 2015. And this allowed the localities to submit their plans and its defined metrics. And it, it outruns any legislator. It used to be that legislators would reallocate the money based on who was elected, you know, and unfortunately or fortunately, we have legislators that come and go in the, in the General Assembly and those pet projects were going unfinished. So I would continue to move forward with smart scale. I think it's great metrics. It's a great way for localities to submit to the Virginia uh, VDOT um, the best projects and, and basically rank those and, and decide where we're gonna spend our money. But second of all, I think we need a lockbox on our transportation fund so that it doesn't continue to get rated. When we have money set aside for transportation, it shouldn't go to any other function, any other expenditure. It needs to stay right there. We need to prioritize our roads. I do see that as a basic core function of government. And um, and while I think the long-term solution is that you know we can look at other modes of transportation, but we also have to remember it comes at a large um, subsidy, and we have to look at the cost to the taxpayer, and is that something that they want to foot the bill for? One thing that I think is an urgent need is repairing our roads and bridges. A lot of people don't realize that we can't even drive a fire truck over some of our current bridges, even right now. And so I would prioritize, first of all, putting a lockbox on that fund, prioritizing money for our basic roads, our infrastructure in our budget, and then making sure that we have a lockbox on those funds. Thanks, Ms. Chase. Uh, Mr. Cox. Well, thanks very much. Obviously, infrastructure is extremely important, roads, rail, and obviously our ports. You know, we keep talking about what issues are big in Northern Virginia, and uh, this is a big one. And think about Terry McAuliffe for a second when he was governor. So he is the one that added $40 tolls that left everyone sitting in traffic. And I-66, which of course is a major uh, road, in, and especially inside the Beltway, remember he gave you new tolls and no new capacity. And so we need to lay that at the feet of the very guy who did that. So tolls inside the Beltway were a terrible idea, and that was his idea. We need to make sure that we're funding projects that deal with congestion. And, and I like smart scale a lot, but under the Northern scoring system, we basically have a state funding formula where congestion only counts 50%. So that obviously is going to hurt them. So it makes no sense to see so many people in Nova sitting in hours of congestion every day. And really, it's at the feet of the Northern and the McAuliffe administration. But let me say something else, too. It's really interesting. I was meeting with a businessman the other day who builds roads and bridges. And he said to me, I have a contract with VDOT. This is the most unbelievable experience. Uh, I've been calling them for 30 days. I can't even get a call back. He says the money's there. It is so poorly run right now uh, that I can't even, I have people ready to work, ready to do these jobs. So part of this also lies with the Northern administration, how poorly they're doing with that particular work. And so in a lot of cases, the money's there, the Northern administration is just not performing. And we see this with the VEC, the Virginia Employment Commission. Remember, they're ranked 50th out of 50 state agencies. And so VDOT's not alone, whether it be DMV, et cetera. So a governor, of course, remember, picks all those agency heads and make sure the trains run on time. So that would be something we could do probably. It would help more than anything. Thanks, Mr. Cox. Uh, Mr. De Lavinia. Well, thank you very much. I had a wise uncle who was a philosopher who said, con dinero vale el perro, which means with money, the dog will dance. So if you have money, 
you can get things done. And so what we need to do as a Commonwealth is I would start by conducting a mission analysis as we do in the Army of what do you have available? What seems to be the problem? And I can tell you the first thing you've got to do is I would put in place a reduction in regulations, reduction of taxes, and control spending. Because if you can do that, you grow wealth. Because if you want to look at how to produce wealth, you look at Lou Rockwell, who says that wealth is a product of human creativity and an environment of freedom. We need to create that environment. And we've done it before, we can do it again. As soon as you open up the economy, the money will come. And then you've got to make sure that you make wise use of that money. When we're talking about roads, <clears throat> spend the money that's assigned for roads on roads. Oftentimes we don't do that. There's all these taxes that are designed for construction of infrastructure and we don't do it. And it is a, it's a common worldwide problem. I've been all over the place now and I've seen what our roads look like. I've seen the condition of some of our bridges. We have to get on that. And if you allow some of the localities to come up with, with creative solutions, we can work this. But the only way we're gonna be able to do this, open up the economy, open up the schools, let's get things back to work, let's get back to normal. Virginia is a wealthy commonwealth. When I first went to the Pentagon, the 395 quarter was, was very narrow. By the time I've lived here for several years or several decades, now I've seen it grow. And the worst thing that could have happened is by allowing those toll roads to be put in place. And what we need to do is take a look at what are the legal ramifications of controlling some of that spending and see if we can get some of that renegotiated. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. De La Pena. Uh, we'll now turn things back over to Sham. Thank you. Candidates, for the next question, you'll have, again, two minutes. The candidate order will be Johnson, Snyder, Yunkin, Chase, Cox, De La Pena, and Duran. And here's the question. Northern Virginia has trended blue over a decade, but we know we need to do well in NOVA to win back the governor's mansion. If you are the nominee, what two issues do you plan to focus on to win Northern Virginia in the general election? Ms. Johnson. Um, I would focus on going into the communities that the Republicans normally do not go in, that I would go in and meet the people. I would uh, go into their businesses, greet them, let them know what my platform is and what I want to, to do as governor of this great commonwealth is what I would do in Northern Virginia. And I would let them know that I am concerned about their, their needs. What is it that they need in their communities? What is it that they lack? What is it that they're looking, looking for? So I would be concerned about the people and talk to them about what it is and make sure that I go into the, commun into the communities that no one else goes into, that I would go in there and meet those people. I would break bread in those communities with the people because they need to know who I am and what I'll be bringing to the table. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Schneider. As a longtime Northern Virginia resident and business owner, I gotta tell you, this one is easy. It is, and I, it's a question I get all across the Commonwealth. And Pete, hey, in other parts of Virginia, we're going to do our part, but how do you win Northern Virginia? It is about schools and it is about small business. There has been no other region more harder hit by these unions locking out our kids and our teachers than Northern Virginia. And it's all the counties that Republicans have been having the biggest problem with over the past 10 years Prince William County. Fairfax County, Loudoun County are the hotbeds of this absolute mess in our schools. They're also the hotbeds of, of this ridiculous critical race theory and 1619 project being worming its way into our classrooms. Uh, so you have people, uh, independents and lean Democrats, folks that haven't given us the time of day in over 10 years, that are actually becoming single issue voters as it relates to the schools. I see all the time 
people online saying, hey, look, I've been a lifelong Democrat, but uh, this guy who wants to open up our schools, Snyder, I'm with him and I'm gonna vote Republican in November so we can open up our schools. And small business, the work that my wife and I and so many of you all helped us out with, with Virginia 30 Day Fund, uh, saving small businesses. There's been no community hit more harder hit in Northern Virginia than the Korean community. By a five to one ratio, you're more likely to be an entrepreneur in the Korean community than any other demographic in Northern Virginia. These folks have been crippled by these shutdowns. We help them out. We are gonna work to open up our economy. And with those two issues, we are going to be able to do better than any Republican has in the past 10 years. And that's why I, as your nominee, are going to take down Tara McAuliffe and win in Northern Virginia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Yunkin. Thank you. So 27 years ago, uh, my lovely wife, Suzanne, and I moved to Northern Virginia. I'd grown up in Richmond and, and uh, Hampton Roads. And we know Northern Virginia incredibly well. And the challenge with Republicans in Northern Virginia for the last 11 years is that we've forgotten how to go speak to voters. So the two issues that we will focus on in Northern Virginia are one, speaking into the minority community. Now you're gonna hear people talk about this. We actually started it, started it the day we launched our campaign. Why? Because guess what happens on May 9th? On May 9th, we have four and a half short months until we get to election time. And if we want to wait till May or June to start running, running, in, running in these strategies to connect with voters, we've wasted too much time. So we have already launched coalitions. We've launched them, we've launched them into the Korean community, the Indian community, the Black community, the Hispanic community. We are already working in these communities today with folks about how we're going to listen and engage as Republicans. I had the most amazing meeting with the, with, with the uh, Hindu American coalition. And at the end of the meeting, they said, Glenn, we're for you. But the last Republican governor to come see us was Bob McDonald. This is what Republicans have done wrong. The second big initiative for us is women. Women in Northern Virginia moved away from the Republican party. That's not a judgment, that's just fact. And so we launched Women for Glenn right at the beginning in order to engage women back in the Republican party with a vision of what Virginia can be and a candidate they can trust, a conservative candidate that can represent them. So this is what we must do. We must reach in today, now, into the minority communities, which are now the majority communities, and speak to women. And this is how we're gonna win in November and we're gonna get back our great Commonwealth. Thank you, Ms. Chase. Well, in a normal year, I would say that our that the two top issues in Northern Virginia would be the traffic and the congestion and also our schools. But in this year, I think it's a little bit different because of COVID. And what the number one issue I think we need to tackle is eliminating these onerous executive orders. That takes care of a lot of things, businesses, schools, capacity. We can get Virginia back to being Virginia again. Um, I do agree with Glenn that women are the key to winning Northern Virginia. And friends, I am the first female to ever seek the Republican nomination for governor. And if you want to win Northern Virginia, we need a different type of, of candidate this year. I'm an educated, professional woman, which matches a lot of the uh, women that are up in Northern Virginia. And they are rooting for Amanda Chase. And I've been campaigning since February of 2020. And I spent quite a lot of time in Northern Virginia listening yes to the minority communities who've come, many of them from socialist countries and have said, please, Amanda, you have got to save us, stand and have a backbone against this leftist regime that wants to come after us. Everyone knows that I have a backbone. I've done it in the Virginia Senate. I've stood against socialism. I've stood against the mask mandates. They even built a box around me on the floor of the Senate because I refuse to wear a mask. Um, I've been censured on the floor of the Senate because I refuse to have my free speech rights taken away from me. And I wanna to apologize to the Democrats. But the top two issues I believe in Northern Virginia and what I hear from constituents, the traffic, the congestion, and reopening our schools. Thank you, Mr. Cox. 
Yeah, the top two issues to me are obviously going to be roads and getting people back and forth. And I've talked about Terry McCall. I think it's going to be a very tough issue for him. The second one is going to be opening schools. And even more than that, uh, so what are you going to do with learning loss? And I have the all initiative that will really focus on making up for the three to six months kids have lost in reading and math. And that, of course, talks about intense tutoring, opting into summer school. Obviously, there should be a, a school choice component. Critical race theory, obviously, is very hot in Northern Virginia. And it simply just divides us. I mean, we're, we're the nation that's the melting pot, uh, that everyone comes and has a common set of beliefs. So that's very important. I agree with the minority outreach very much. But once again, you, you have to talk about who's actually done that. I have the most, re the bluest Republican district in the state. It's 30 percent minority. I started off teaching in a inner city school. And so, you know, actually, I've been there and, and really worked that actually won that district. That was the number one target of the Democrats to be because I was speaker of the House. And we went into those neighborhoods and we knocked 8000 doors. We met with people. Uh, I had to put coalitions together in the Indian community and in the Asian Korean community, et cetera. And there's some also some smaller issues, I think, that are very big up there. Uh, TJ. The governor's school is huge, where the Democrats have taken that from a merit-based system, number one uh, governor's school in the nation, to now where it's basically open enrollment. And those parents are furious. They want quality, good education. So I do think for the first time since Bob McDonald in 2009, Republicans can get votes in Northern Virginia, but we have to show up. You have to show up. You've got to spend an immense amount of time up there uh, in all those communities. They see you as very inauthentic. If you talk that you're going to come, and you don't come. And I've always done that in every race. I've done that in my district, and I will do that running for governor. Thank you, Mr. De La Pena. Thank you very much. The two key issues that most Northern Virginians are concerned about are schools and the economy. We've got to open them up, and they're tied together. But the only candidate that can actually expand the voting base is me because I can reach out to those immigrant communities, especially the Hispanics, in Spanish. I've done it before with President Trump. I did 60 interviews in Spanish during the campaign, and we got 29% of the vote. I know how to reach through these communities. I've talked to these communities. As a matter of fact, I spoke with a gentleman in front of my, uh, over with my neighbor who was working on a, on a porch. I started speaking to him in Spanish, and next thing you know, the guy's ready to vote for me. I did, the, I did the same thing at the right to work building. I just went up and say, I'm running for governor, this is what I'm doing. And very quickly they agreed that I was their candidate. And I can do that with the Asian community because that's also, I understand what they've been through because I know about communism, socialism. I fought it myself, my entire professional military career. And I have related to the Chinese uh, patriots that told me that they understand what it is to be under communism. They don't want any part of it. When I asked them about how they've gone through the Americanization experiences I did as an immigrant, we agreed that both of us have become assimilated. And now, though we come from completely different backgrounds, we are one American. And we're all about being Americans. And that's what it's all about, is that all Americans are concerned about schools. They're concerned about the economy. And that's what we've got to focus on. No one else can do that. We have to expand the base. I can and will expand the base. I made it a part of my campaign from the very beginning, and I've been citing it over and over again. When you take my background, where I started from and where I ended, I know what it is to be the outsider because I am the outsider. I was a soldier. I know what it is. I can get things done, and I will. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Duran. Thank you. So living in Arlington, uh, I got to tell you, I live this every single day. And I, we're gonna win Northern Virginia by putting candidates on the ballot. I'm really glad that I, I went last because I think this is exactly what I've been talking about. Did, uh, Republicans, did you notice what happened? We heard a lot of I, 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 me, 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 but not once did we hear a lot of we. If we're going to win, we need to field winning Republican candidates. Last night, I held a meet and greet for five of our awesome house of delegate republican candidates because it's not it shouldn't be about the individual it shouldn't be about the politician riding in on a horse saying i'm going to solve all your problems for you for you republicans 
No one is coming to save us. It falls to us to save ourselves. And we know that because there are Republicans in our Commonwealth who abandoned us. There are Republicans in our Commonwealth who looked at themselves and prioritized themselves instead of our Republican ballots. And what happened? In 2019, we didn't have any Republicans to vote for in 30% of our legislative races. Here in Arlington, we know what that was like. We had five Democrats on our ballot and no Republicans because we were, we were abandoned. We were surrendered. The surrender strategy must end. And here's what we replace it with. We field winning Republican candidates who are right now standing up and answering the call. And then we talk about what matters here in Northern Virginia, what matters across all, schools, safety, and jobs. So yeah, we're gonna phase out the income tax, go to 0%. That's a winner, not just in Northern Virginia, but across our Commonwealth. But I've got a special message for the ladies of Loudoun County. Loudoun County, you are my heroes. Those of you who stood up against your school board, who got on a blacklist, I had a chance to meet some of you. You are my personal heroes, and I think you should be the model for every Republican and every Virginian, because you won't let anyone bully you. We're gonna win, we're gonna back the Loudoun County ladies as they stand up to their school board and we are going to field a winning Thank alternative you. that says Virginia should be the best. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'll turn it back over to Ron for the next question. Thank you. Okay, uh, sorry guys, I'm at the uh, kitchen table and uh, so we've got kitchen table questions here um, and uh, I'm lucky to be by myself tonight or unlucky because my wife is a Catholic school teacher and they've been teaching in person since August. So uh, here we go. We're going to do uh, security and rule of law. Last year, Virginia Democrats tried unsuccessfully to slash the Virginia State Police budget and reduce aid to local police departments. Um, many American localities that have cut or uh, attempted to cut their police budgets now face increasing crime rates coupled with officer retirements and low police morale. Yet some Americans, particularly minorities, generally fear police interactions. As governor, what is your specific plan to assure that we address these concerns while properly funding and maintaining public safety? So we'll start off with Mr. Snyder. Sure, Ron. Look, we are not going to defund the police under Governor Snyder. We are going to fully fund our police and our law enforcement officers. You know, Ralph Northam targeted our sheriffs and their deputies for actually standing up for our, their, our Second Amendment rights. And that was absolutely wrong. I'm going to make sure we bridge the gap. There's nearly a 30% gap between sheriff deputies and their counterparts in the state police. That is just wrong and we are gonna correct that. We're gonna give our law enforcement officers all of the training and the equipment and the salaries and benefits commensurate for what they do for us, which is put their lives on the line every single day. And more than all of that, we are going to give our law enforcement officials the respect that they so greatly deserve. You know, Tara McAuliffe, is just another one who bent down to the woke mob when they came a knocking. About two weeks ago, he reversed his position on qualified immunity and said that he wants to get rid of it for police officers and law enforcement officials. That will absolutely gut law enforcement and send crime rates through the roof all around Virginia. You won't be, sheriffs won't be able to retain their talent. You won't be able to attract talent if you're a deputy making $34,000 a year and you can lose your house, I'm going to absolutely say no to that. We need to have qualified immunity for our law enforcement officials, but we need to give them all of the training, equipment, salaries, and respect that they so desperately need and deserve. That will make for a safer Virginia for everyone. Okay. All right. Thanks, Pete. Uh, Mr. Youngkin, you're up next. Great, thank you. And let's just be clear, the, the Democrat agenda here is to have a bad police force or, or law enforcement capability and to not keep people in prison. That's what the agenda is. And we need to recognize that by defunding, by having low salaries, by getting rid of qualified immunity, then they are absolutely executing against their plan. 
So as governor, I will make sure that law enforcement is fully funded. I think Pete and I agree on this, must be fully funded. And in fact, the salaries that are paid to deputy sheriffs and sheriffs and police officers across the Commonwealth are too low. But oh, by the way, we also have to address retirement benefits for them. Because the retirement, when they retire and they look at, they're looking for health care, they can't even afford to live. And then finally, if we take away qualified immunity, if we allow qualified immunity to take, be taken away, we're going to have massive retirements across our law, our law enforcement community. So what do we have to do? We have to actually invest in our law enforcement officers. We actually have to retain the most senior ones because right now we have unfortunately, young officers playing the role of supervisor because of the heavy retirements. And as a result of this defunding initiative, we're seeing crime rates across Virginia escalate. I was literally just with one of our law enforcement heroes at church last weekend in Fairfax County, actually Loudoun County, and he was explaining to me what is going on with crime rates and the media won't even present it. They won't even talk about it. So folks, let's just be clear. We have to invest in our law enforcement. We have to increase salaries. We have to give them the equipment they need. We must protect them from legislation like the stripping of qualified immunity. And then we have to engage in transparency and training initiatives to make sure we have the best police forces in the country, the very best. And this is our target, not to defund them and make them the worst and have high crime rates. This is how we increase safety and comfort in the community in Virginia. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Uh, Senator Chase, please. Uh, As a Virginia state senator, I've actually carried the Fraternal Order of Police legislation for the past six years and have passed at least four bills that were signed into law for our law enforcement. I've stood up on the floor of the Senate in defense of our law enforcement to ensure that they would continue to keep their qualified immunity, I've delivered many floor speeches about the importance of supporting law enforcement and not taking away the tools that Senator Hashmi, for instance, uh, attempted to take away and actually was successful at restricting the tools in their toolbox. You know, we need to stop being the Monday morning quarterbacks for our law enforcement. We need to give them all the tools they need, beginning with fully funding. As a Virginia state senator working with the General Assembly, we have actually worked at, with the Fusion Center, and I know Speaker Cox, myself, and other members of the Chesterfield legislature uh, actually worked on increasing our Virginia state police salaries by $7,000 for our entry level employees and helped to take care of some of those wage compression issues. We have a tremendous shortage of law enforcement in our state police and we need to do like Chesterfield County has done where you have good leadership at the top. We have democratic leadership at the top of the Virginia state police right now and I would change that. Uh, the question was, how do we take care of minority communities who are scared of the police? I think that personnel is policy. We have to put the right training in place, but that doesn't mean that we defund our police. I've argued from the beginning that we've never fully funded our police. That would be a high priority for a Chase administration. Listen, when it comes to the rule of law, know that I will stand. I will, I will fire our parole board. I will make sure that we have law and order here in the state of Virginia. And I will always have the back of our law enforcement, just as I did with my comments over the last recent verdict yesterday. Okay, thank you, Senator. Uh, Delegate Cox, you're up next, please. Well, thanks, Ron. The very first proposal I put out this year, along with Bill Curico, who's running for governor and dropped out and backed me. And of course he was a state trooper expert in this, we call it the Partnership for Safe Virginia. And that specifically says we need to put $50 million towards both state police and sheriff deputies pay. And we've heard about starting pay, which is very important. Another very important piece is compression. And compression would be maybe a first sergeant in the state police or a sheriff's deputy that has 10 or 12 years in. We're losing so many of those. We have to deal with the compression issue. Uh, a lot has been said, obviously, about morale. It's the worst I have ever seen it. And the Democrats have really attacked in that special session everything about I think law enforcement. And so we can talk about things like the parole board, which has been mentioned. But remember, once again, this is Northern and Terry McCullough's parole board. They've let eight or nine murderers out. Uh, they didn't follow the law. Victims weren't notified. 
this is one of the most egregious things I've seen in my 32 years. Things like minimum mandatories, uh, making sure that if you commit that type of violent crime, you at least serve some, some time. Even for things like child rapists, we had a bill on that actually the original bill said if you're a child rapist, 13 and under, you don't even get minimum mandatory. That's sort of where they're at. The other part I think was a good question is, so what are we gonna do about the trust factor? And let me mention maybe one area, school resource officers, something the Democrats have basically tried to pull out of our schools. When I chaired the speaker's committee uh, on school safety, we had the opposite approach. We wanted to double the amount of school resource officers. Let me tell you why. School resource officer is your assistant football coach. He's your assistant baseball coach. He gets to know the kids in whatever school in a, in a really unique way. So you get to see law enforcement, not in that adversarial way, but in a much more way where the kids really come to respect them. And so when you actually put programs like that in, it actually helps dramatically what you could do. So that will be one of my top priorities as governor. Thank you, thank you, Kurt. Uh, Mr. De La Pena, you're up next, please. Thank you, sir. I've spent my life focused on rule of law, and I've trained police forces throughout the world. And one of the things that you've got to have, if you're gonna have prosperity, you have to have security. And that begins by enforcing rule of law. As governor, I will ensure that we focus on rule of law. If you break the law, you will pay the penalties. And I, can, and I agree with everybody else. You've got to fully fund the police. You've got to ensure that you have fully trained police because if you have defunded police or lowly funded police, you're not gonna be able to have that professionalism that's required to make sure that you keep uh, the appropriate folks in office. I've spoken with numerous police officers throughout the Commonwealth and they're all telling me they're becoming disheartened because of all the rule changes that favor criminals and penalize law enforcement officers. We cannot do that. We won't do that. I will not do that. We will. I will make sure that we fix that problem immediately. You break the law, you're going to pay the price. You, you cannot have that type of situation fester. One of the issues that always comes up is what about the minority communities? If you have defunded police, those that most suffer are high crime areas. And sadly, oftentimes that comes from minority communities. What minority communities need least is to have less police presence because where crimes are committed is where you need to focus your attention. Now, are there better ways of doing it? Yes. We've got the processes, we've got the procedures, we've got the training, but the biggest thing that you need is backing for your law enforcement officials. Once they feel that they have the backing of their governor, they are going to be able to provide a good, safe environment. We are about strong families, a, a, a meaningful work, and safe communities. And that's what it takes to have a strong Virginia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sergio. Uh, Mr. Duran, you're up next. Thank you, Ron. Uh, before I say anything about my vision for how we're going to be the best state in the country when it comes to safety, when it comes to law and order, uh, Octavia, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for your service as Sheriff of Roanoke and everything you did to serve your community. I wanna thank you for that, Octavia. And the reason I, I really wanna start with that is because for me, Blue is family, law enforcement's family. My brother-in-law is a police officer in St. Paul. Over the summer, I was getting almost hourly updates because he was in riot lines all summer long as law and order descended into chaos in Minnesota. And Blue? My grandfather was a cop. My grandmother was one of the first female police officers in Cleveland, Ohio. And so when I talk about standing in support of our law enforcement, uh, that's not a campaign slogan. When I talk about being number one for safety in Virginia, it's not a slogan, it's a vision for how we're gonna lead. Right now, look at what we've seen. I actually think we've seen a lot of good ideas here when it comes to increasing law and order in our commonwealth. I think as Republicans, we have the opportunity to show a clear and compelling difference with Democrats. Democrats, they are trying to decriminalize criminality. Right now in Virginia, there are too many police officers who feel that the governor doesn't have their back. When they go out, eat on their shift, they don't know what could happen, but I'm sure their spouses and partners back at home are more worried that if something does happen and they follow their training perfectly, they won't have a governor 
who will support them. That's going to change. My pledge to all law enforcement and all Virginians is, look, law enforcement has our back. They need a governor who has got theirs. My philosophy is if you break the law, you'll face the law. So yes, we're going to have the best trained police force in the country. We're going to have the best paid police force in the country, and that should go equally for all members of law enforcement, regardless of where you live in Virginia. And we are going to let all of Virginia know the law enforcement community is allowed to do their job. Okay, well, thank you, Peter. And Sheriff Johnson, please finish up the questioning on public safety for us. Thank you. Law enforcement is a group of people that put a uniform on every morning, every evening, or every night to lay their lives on the line. Sometimes they go out as a SWAT team in dangerous, more dangerous situations, but they're all dangerous. My husband was on a SWAT team and one night he got the call that he had to go out on the SWAT team. The fear that the wife feels, the things that goes through the officer that gets that call, that he has to go out and put himself in a dangerous situation that they know is there and they have to take care of it. And to defund the police, you know, just to even think about that, what word comes to me is, is insane. If you defund them, who's going to be protecting the communities? Where's the safety and security going to be coming from? So you don't defund the police, you fund them. You make sure they get the proper equipment that they need to do their jobs and, and actually give them the money because you want equipment that will work. So you don't want the low end of the scale. You need to get the equipment that will work and last so that when they go out to do their job, that they have the tools and that they are workable. And the training, they need more on, on hands training because they took it out that they do everything on the computer. But you know, you don't need to do everything on the computer. They need hands-on. As Sheriff of Roanoke City, I would look for classes to send my officers because I want them to have that continual interaction with the other departments as to what new things were happening or things that they were doing the that we weren't Thank doing. you, Sheriff. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sheriff Johnson. I uh, guess we'll move uh, to the lightning round next with uh, Richard. You're going to lead us off on that, right? Yes, thanks, Ron. Yep. Uh, so now our candidates will have 30 seconds. Um, and uh, we'll begin with uh, Mr. Youngkin. The question is, if you do not win the Republican nomination for governor, do you pledge to throw your support behind the Republican nominee? Yes. Seconds. Yes. Very straightforward. The opportunity in front of us must be one that we take now. And so with that answer, I invite everyone to support me because we are winning. And this is what's happening right now. So folks, what's gonna happen over the course of the next two and a half weeks is gonna be critical. We're gonna have a convention. We're gonna have to come together like never before and pick a candidate who can win. But it's not about me, it's about us. And that's why we started Virginia Wins. And that's why we're gonna run a Lieutenant Governor and Attorney General campaign that's gonna be about a team. Not about I, not three separate races, but one team, and we are going to go win in November. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Youngkin. Ms. Chase? So the answer is yes. You know, we each paid $14,000 a piece and paid $14,000 of our campaign finance money to com and committed and signed a pledge. And I'm a woman of my word, but I will tell you this. It's also with the assumption that this is a fair convention that is run. And I'm counting on the Republican Party of Virginia to be fair. Thanks, Mr. Chief. Mr. Cox? Yes, uh, I've spent my entire life uh, in the Republican Party. I was a unit chairman back in Colonial Heights, and I was the Reagan Bush Volunteer of the Year locally in 1984. It's so much bigger than us. It's about stopping one party 
Democrat control. Uh, it's urgent times. We have to do that. Uh, certainly, I think I'm the best candidate to do that. Uh, but you bet. Uh, we've got to get behind Republicans and unite and win in November. Thanks, Mr. Cox. Mr. De La Pena? Absolutely, yes. Unequivocally. Uh, we're we're going to win. I'm going to win because I'm building popular support. I've got the, I, I got to make a correction. I've got the largest number of small donors of any of the candidates. My movement is from the grassroots. I am getting more and more support every place that I go, and I look forward to getting all that money that I've just don't have. I've got to get it from small donors. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. De La Pena. Mr. Duran? This is an easy one. 100% yes, absolutely, because I'm a Republican, and I understand it's not about the individual. It's about the team. It's about our shared Republican ideas. It's about a vision, and that vision, as Republicans, I know it'll win. I just don't want to talk the talk. I walk the walk, and I'll tell you why. Last night, I mentioned it before. We brought out five House of Delegates members. That's not a governor. That's that's not a, that's not sort of in my own self-interest to do that. That's in the interest of all Republicans. I'm going to be meeting May 3rd Republicans in Charlottesville to do the same. I will support our nominee and all of our House of Delegates candidates to win. Thank you, Mr. Duran. Thanks, Mr. Duran. Uh, Ms. Johnson. Thank you. Yes, yes, and yes. I will support the nominee because I am running because we need a change in this great commonwealth. And the only way change is going to come is that a Republican it takes office on November the 2nd. Hopefully it will be me, but if not, we need to win because we don't want any more of those laws put into place that the Democrats have been doing. We want our first and second amendments. We want pro-life. So, yes, I will support the candidate. Thanks, Ms. Johnson. Mr. Schneider. 100%. We have to take down Terry McAuliffe in November. And Virginia Republicans know me. They know three things about me. They know I'm a hard worker. They know that I'm a true conservative. And they know that I'm a team player. In life, things don't always work out your way. And people know what I do when to pitch in and help make sure and have our team in Republicans win. We will make sure that happens in November. I hope and expect that I'm gonna be leading our field, but guess what? If I'm not, I'm gonna be behind any single one of these candidates with a smile on my face and hustle in my heart. Thanks, Mr. Schneider. Uh, I'll now turn things back over to Sham. Thanks, Richard. Candidates, this is the uh, second and final lightning round question. You have 30 seconds each. The candidate order is Chase, Cox, De La Pena, Duran, Johnson, Snyder, and Yunkin. Here's the question. We understand that each of you are Republicans and conservatives. How would you distinguish yourself from among your fellow candidates? Ms. Chase. Well, number one, I'm a firebrand Republican who has a conservative voting record that you can count on. Friends, there's no surprise here. You have a voting record that shows exactly where I stand on the issue of 100%, whether we're talking about life, gun rights, business, election security, statues and monuments, election integrity. I've been 100% on all of those issues, and I have a voting record to back that up. Mr. Cox. I would say my service, if you look, I've done over 100 veterans bills, been honored to be VFW, American Legion, Legislator of the Year, Chamber Legislator of the Year. I think it's going to mean a whole lot knowing the budget inside and out and being able to day one, you got four years, day one, hit the ground running and change this Commonwealth back for the better in, in this one party democratic rule. I don't think anyone else has that breadth of leadership and experience. Mr. De La Pena. Thank you very much. I'm the only candidate who can win in a general because I can win in Northern Virginia because I can expand the voting base because I can reach those immigrant communities in Spanish. I've done it before. I did it for President Trump. I can do it again. I can do it with the Asian communities and I can do it with the military communities. I'm the one that can do this and no one else can because you do not have the background. I can do this. 
and I will do this. Thank you very much. Mr. Duran. Thank you. I think, I hope we saw it this evening. Out of all the fine candidates, Republicans, you have to choose from, I'm the only one who's put forward a winning vision for how we're going to lead. And I have specifics. I have big ideas, and I'm specific about exactly what those are. Find out more at peterduran.org. But remember this, Republicans, when we win, we win on a vision, and we win on big ideas like phasing out the income tax. I'm the only candidate in this race who has done that, and that's my fight. Ms. Johnson. Thank you. I was elected as institutional officer of the city of Roanoke by the citizens of this great. Uh, I uh, have of 250 people, and I was elected by the people, and uh, I will have the interest of the people that they, the first thing for me would be the citizens of Virginia, that I do everything for the best, that I care for them and they know that I will do all that I can for. Mr. Schneider. Sure, what makes me different is that I am a business outsider. Uh, I have been an entrepreneur, an innovator. I not only started sm a small company, but I helped create a new industry that now employs millions all across the world. Uh, I am a true conservative. I've been a fighter in our conservative movement for over 25 years, and I get things done. During the worst crisis we've had in over 100 years, my wife and I started a nonprofit that ended up leading America. We ended up saving nearly 3,000 small businesses all across the country, 1,000 right here in Virginia. I am a conservative, I'm an outsider, and I can get things done, and I will win in November and take Terry McAuliffe down. Mr. Youngkin. Yes, thank you. The most important question you've asked all night. I have a 30-year business career that is so differentiated from anybody here, any Republican, any Democrat, any Democrat. I have delivered, I understand what it means to be held responsible for results, not empty promises. And folks, we are in fact running a differentiated campaign. Republicans have lost for over a decade and there's folks here that have been part of that. And I am running a differentiated campaign that will win. We are reaching out to Virginians and we're gonna deliver a win in November, not just for me, but across the Republican parties and we're gonna take back and put her back where she belongs as the best state Thanks. in America. Thank you. Thank you very much, candidates. I'll turn it back over to Richard. Thanks, Sham. Uh, and now it's time for closing statements. Uh, each candidate will have two minutes and we will begin with Mr. Cox. Well, Richard, thank you so much. Let me thank the 8th, 10th, and 11th districts for hosting this forum. Uh, what a great opportunity. I mean, this is what it's all about, being able to basically sort of talk about what you believe in, et cetera. So it's been uh, wonderful for me. I will reemphasize being the man in the arena. I think that means a lot. I mean, you go back to 1989, I won in the biggest upset, and then fast forward to 2019 as speaker, the target of every Democrat, and I still won in very tough districts. The only really proven winner to me as far as that's concerned. Proven conservative, support of Governor Allen, Governor McDonald, over 500 grassroots leaders. But here's what it comes down to. I, I've been really blessed. Uh, boy, 32 years being in the legislature, I never dreamed of uh, being speaker or having these opportunities. I love Virginia. Uh, the Virginia that I love for 32 years is more than under attack. The Democrats just have a fundamentally different worldview. I've never seen anything like it. Time is of the essence. We have to win in November. There's an urgency. I see Republicans coalescing, et cetera. And once whoever takes office, and Kirk Cox to me is that person, you gotta be ready day one. You have to know what you're doing. There are over 200 boards and commissions that you appoint, parole board, college board of visitors, state superintendent. If you wanna turn things around, you need to know those ins and outs. And Kirk Cox will turn things around and turn things around quickly. So I would love to have your support as a delegate. Uh, it's been great to be at this forum and uh, God bless both Virginia 
and the United States of America. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Mr. Cox. Uh, Mr. De La Pena. Thank you very much. I'm going to reiterate the reason I, can, I, I will win is because I can expand the voter base. We keep trotting out, we keep on putting forth the same type of candidates and we keep losing. I can reach out to that immigrant community because I am an immigrant. I can, I'm the only candidate in this race who's worked for President Donald Trump during his campaign and during his time in office. I'm the only soldier in this campaign. When we talk about personal responsibility and making sure that results matter, I know what that's like because people's lives depend on it. I've had that responsibility and I've executed on that responsibility. And with President Trump, I did it repeatedly. For three and a half years, I worked as a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Western Hemisphere Affairs. We had crises that required immediate decisions and I got those done. And I'm the only candidate that can get us back to where we need to be. This is, we're in a critical time. We are facing critical threats. We are seeing the devolution of what Virginia was. This is a cradle of the American experiment that is being destroyed by this current governor and this general assembly. We've got to turn it back. I can get it done. Nobody else can because if you don't expand the voter base, we're not going to win. If we don't win, we're going to be seeing Virginia turn into California and New York. Uh, I want to do a special shout out for the 11th district since I'm a member. Uh, I'm, I'm proud to have been part of the 11th district. Uh, Burke is my home. I, I love Burke dearly. And uh, this is this is the home for soldiers. This is where we all end up. And so I, I couldn't be prouder to represent Burke and I couldn't be prouder to be your next governor. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. De La Pena. Mr. Duran. Thank you, Richard. Uh, I hope you saw it tonight when I say that we need a winning vision that all Republicans and all Virginians can rally behind, that Virginia sh should be the best, that we should go to number one. Uh, even tonight, we saw other Republicans following that lead, rallying around in this discussion, my vision for being number one. We are going to be the best, but again, Republicans, that's not a slogan. That is a vision for how we're going to lead. Right now, we have to be specific. No more slogans. We need to be specific because Terry McAuliffe has a vision. Terry McAuliffe wants to run Virginia off a cliff. Terry McAuliffe wants to put teachers unions in charge of our educational system. I say no. We are going to break the monopoly that teachers unions have on our educational system. Terry McAuliffe, he wants to put allow charlatans, critical race theory charlatans to have control over our educational curriculum here in Virginia. I say, no, we are going to be number one. We're going to go right past Florida, right past Ron DeSantis, and we're going to be number one in getting critical race theory out of our classrooms and reforming our curriculum. And Terry McAuliffe, well, he's already said he wants to tax Virginians into the dirt so that he can pay off all of his political cronies that he's made specific promises to. I say, no, we are going to phase out the state income tax in Virginia and go to 0%. You see, when we put out a vision that makes a clear and compelling contrast to what Democrats are offering, we can win, but you gotta have specifics. You gotta be able to go beyond the bumper sticker slogans and the buzzwords hoping that you will hear a word and like that idea. Republicans, I'm asking you on May 8th to rally around a vision to be the best state in the country, to phase out our state income taxes, and to be, make Virginia a pro-life, pro-family, conservative model for the rest of the country to follow. This is my vision, and I can't wait to join with you on May 8th. Let's do it, Virginia. Thanks, Mr. Duran. Ms. Johnson? Thank you, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak to everyone on this evening. As a governor, you have to be a leader that has courage, discipline, and determination, and that is me. You need a governor that is willing to go to battle, to fight, because we are going to be in a fight to win back this great commonwealth. And we need someone that is strong and is willing to stand for what we believe in. Stand for the First and Second Amendment, to battle, to fight. We need someone that can stand for pro-life, fight 
for life and not as Northam, Governor Northam and his uh, beliefs that you can have the baby and then sit it aside and decide what you want to do. No, he's changed good for evil. And we need a governor that will fight the battle and stand, stand for all Virginians, stand that we become, that the whole state of Virginia can thrive, not just part of Virginia, but the whole state. Southwest Virginia, it needs to thrive. Not away County, it needs to thrive. Roanoke, we need to continue to thrive. Northern Virginia, it needs to thrive. So we have to help all the citizens across this whole great Commonwealth. So we need a governor that will be able to stand and take all the punches and not lay down what he believes, but to continue to stand no matter what they throw at him, that they can take the punches. Her. And I ask for your vote on November, on May 8th. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Johnson. Mr. Schneider? Bravo, 8th, 10th, and 11th. I gotta say, what a respectful and robust conversation tonight. And also, I think it's abundantly clear that we have a wildly talented crop of candidates here. Uh, the, the Commonwealth is gonna be in good hands no matter what when we take down Terry McAuliffe in November, working together. And folks, I'm running for governor, plain and simple, because we are in a horrible, horrible mess right now. And I'd like you to believe that I have the right conservative backbone and the right real world experience, not as a career politician, but as a true business outsider who can get Virginia out of this horrible mess we're in and get us focused and heading in the right direction. We need to open up our schools and fix our schools. We need to open our economy and save small business. And lastly, I'm gonna be a conservative governor that is going to put the rights of law-abiding citizens above those of criminals. Folks, Terry McAuliffe knows what's true. He is coming after me every single day. The Democratic Governors Association is coming after me nearly every single day because they know I am the lone conservative here that can beat Terry McAuliffe in November, and we are going to do just that. But it's not gonna be a solo act. I am bringing a conservative posse with me called a conservative majority in the House of Delegates, also a conservative lieutenant governor and attorney general, and we are gonna win in November, shock the world, and help make Virginia lead again. God bless y'all. Please vote for me on May the 8th. If you got love in your heart for someone else, let me be number two, all right? God bless you and good night. Thanks, Mr. Schneider. Mr. Yunkin? I also want to add my thanks to the 8th, the 10th, and the 11th Congressional District Committees for hosting tonight. I want to thank all the candidates for this great discussion. Um, I just hope everybody recognizes how important this election is. Elections have consequences, and the consequences for Virginians have been crushing over the last eight years. So we have a choice to make right now. We have a choice. How are we going to get our beloved Commonwealth back? I'm a homegrown Virginian, and I am absolutely distraught about our great Commonwealth being in the ditch. And we're gonna go rescue her. We're gonna go rescue her. And Republicans are coming together like never before because we know we must win, and they're coming together behind me. I've heard it all over the Commonwealth. We have signed up nearly 18,000 delegates. Remember, in Lynchburg, they were hoping 5,000 would show up. We are absolutely pressing ahead to win on May the 8th. And when I have the great privilege of going to work for you as your governor, and we announced today that I will not take a salary because I'm gonna go work for you. Unlike Terry McAuliffe, unlike Ralph Northam, who wanna be the fourth highest paid governor in the country, I'm gonna go work for you. And we are gonna stand up and get this economy moving. We're gonna create jobs. Yes, Peter, we're gonna get our state income tax down to zero. We're gonna stand up for our constitutional rights like never before. No, Joe Biden, our constitutional rights are absolute, they are, and I will not be told differently. We're gonna make sure law enforcement is 
funded and they know their governor has their back. We're going to get our schools open and press forward with school choice because our children deserve it. And we're going to move forward with election integrity reform swifter than you can imagine, highlighted by showing up with a photo ID when you vote. Friends, it's not about me. It's about us. We're going to win the top three races. We're going to win back our House of Delegates. And we're going to take our Commonwealth back. And I cannot wait to go work for you as your next governor. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Mr. Yunkin. Ms. Chase, you get the last word. Thank you. I always like getting the last word. First of all, I want to give a huge thanks to the 8th, the 10th, and the 11th for having us this evening. This was an enjoyable uh, discussion here. But let me make, make, make no mistake here. Actually, Terry McAuliffe has identified me as the front runner in this race, along with three independent polls. I've been leading by double digits. And in this last fundraising numbers, you will notice that 60% of my donations have never donated to any political campaign ever before. If you look at the grassroots organization and the amount of support that my campaign has generated since we began back in February 2020, friends, I'm going to win because I started early. As many of you all who are just starting, you know, running for governor right now, you'll learn it is a big state. And Glenn, I think I have over, I got you beat on the number of miles on my van uh, right now with about 80,000 miles on it. It's, it's a big task. And I want to congratulate everyone on this call tonight for their treasure, their time, their talent in seeking the highest office here in Virginia. And listen, I would tell you, that demographic demographics do matter. Sergio, I agree with you. I believe that having a female at the top of the ticket is going to be a plus for Republicans this year. We've never done that before. And listen, I'm not into identity politics, but let's face it, the Democrats are. And that's why I believe Terry McAuliffe has identified me as his biggest threat. And you know what? He's right. I'm a second term state senator. I've already proven that I can be elected in two general elections, I've done it. I know how to raise money, I've done it. And friends, I would tell you that in this race, I have not received a dime of PAC money, not a dime of lobbyist money, and where you get your money matters. And so I would tell you, I would love to have your vote as a delegate. I have a proven track record. I have stood the pressure of the press, the lobbyists, and the PACs, and here I am, standing for we the people, and I would be honored to be your first female governor of Virginia. Thanks, Ms. Chase. Melissa? Thank you so much, candidates, for sharing your vision with Northern Virginia Republicans and how you plan on bringing sane government back to the Commonwealth. We can't wait to find out who's going to be leading us in uh, across the ticket, not just in this race, but in the lieutenant governor race and the AG race and Thank you for all that you're doing and, and for running. We also want to thank the moderators, the rule keepers, and the timekeepers, not just in this event tonight, but for the past three weeks, all the work that the 8th, 10th, and 11th have done in making this success. And fellow Republicans across Northern Virginia, over the last three weeks, we have heard the vision and the plan of many great, wonderful, well-qualified candidates. We have a tough decision ahead of us. And we want to just give you one more reminder that the convention is on Saturday, May 8th, and the voting window is from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. And we have a tough decision to make, but here's what I do know, that on the other side of May 8th, we're all going to be able to walk a little taller and a little straighter because we are going to have the best slate representing us going into the general election that we've had in a long time. So thank you all for coming. Thank you, candidates, once again, for the sacrifice in running and representing us. And this concludes our third and last candidate forum across Northern Virginia. Thanks all, and good night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank Not you. Blessed. Thank you, Republicans.